Okay, as usual, the social and uh, emotional development of any particular stage is always a little bit more interesting than the uh, the physical and, and cognitive things. Physical and cognitive has a tendency to be a little bit dry. Um, so we're on chapter 14 now. Um, now, in the book, they really start getting over the, the role of some adults not thinking that they're adults yet, and they refer to this as emerging adulthood. And it's something to think about. Um, I mean, obviously, I've broached the, the subject quite a bit so far, um, but it's interesting to debate whether or not... Uh, hold on a second. I've had some volume problems. Maybe I can simply turn off a nearby fan. Um... One of the things to think about with the emerging adulthood is um, whether it is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, because there's a, a lot of uh, debate, um, and this is something that, that isn't particularly based on a lot of facts. It has some ups and it has some downs. Um, first of all, emerging adulthood is something that is just generally seen in industrialized nations like our own. Um, so one argument could be made that the emerging adulthood gives us the ability to excel and that perhaps it's even a side effect of the vast amount of responsibility that we actually place on people uh, and the vast amount of knowledge that we require of ordinary citizens. Excuse me. You take a third world country and they're not going to have any emerging adulthood. You go from, you know, you go from adolescence uh, straight into adulthood because you have responsibilities to take care of. However, on the other hand, um, they also have far less that they have to know. Their schooling is much is much smaller, uh, and in fact, a lot of what we would learn in school they would have no use for whatsoever because they, they simply don't have the, the complex uh, lives that we have, or you know the luxuries that come with those complex lives. Uh, being able to take you know classes online, for example, is a great example of that. Uh, so that's one. One argument is that it's a side effect of the uh, vast amounts of training that we have to give somebody in order to actually become an adult. Now, the other argument is that it's a side effect of us being a bunch of spoiled little babies, um, and that's you know that is the the other argument, which also seems to have some uh, grain of truth in it, because we are clearly a very spoiled nation, and the more spoiled the nation is, the more it seems to have this long-term emerging adulthood. Um, Perhaps ultimately the idea would be to take the take the good with the bad, but um, uh, but it's an interesting thought one way or the other. Now, uh, Erickson has a theory on uh, young adulthood, um, and he he defines it from about the age of twenty to forty instead of eighteen to forty. Basically, all the same thing. Uh, his stage is intimacy versus isolation. Now. One of the neat things that they don't really get into much with in the in the book, they gloss over it every once in a while, and that's kind of a shame, is the idea of these um, stages that Erickson has. These are referred to as dialectics. Uh, that means that you have a choice between one or the two things during some sort of conflict. Uh, in this case, they're developmental conflicts. Uh, but these are with relationships and everything. There's a lot of dialectics. Um, and... Um, and so you have to kind of go through this particular conflict. And typically speaking, with any dialectic, you're going to have drawbacks if you go too far to one extreme or another. Um, so if you have one of the dialectic conflicts, uh, getting out of Erickson, uh, just going to say a relationship conflict, we'll be talking about relationships a little bit later on, is um, whether or not you're independent or dependent on somebody else. Now, if you're very dependent on another person, you know, say your wife or whatnot, then uh, that really frees you up to do other things. There's a lot of advantage in that. Uh, if I never, if I'm dependent on on my wife to cook, for example, it's not how it goes in, in my house. I do a lot of the cooking, most of it, really. But um, but let's say we're talking about 1950s gender norms, and I rely on my wife to take care of the house and do the cleaning, and uh, and she's completely dependent on me because I'm the one bringing home the bacon for cook, obviously, because I would never figure out how to cook that with my big, dumb male mind. Um, there's a lot of security in, uh, in having that high of a level of dependence um, in this particular dialectic conflict, because uh, you know the other person is not going to leave you, because they can't, 
Um, so they're going to develop a very strong bond with you. At the same time, that gives you all this time to, to free up your efforts to things you're actually more interested in. You know, you can become a better breadwinner if you don't have the constant stress of having to worry about the house and the children and all these other things that your wife is doing. And quite frankly, the wife doesn't want all the, the trouble you're dealing with either. Um, uh, yet on the other side of that dialectic conflict is independence. You know, dependency versus independence. And there's a lot of advantages to being independent as well. Um, you get a lot of self-confidence. Um, when somebody isn't there, you're not screwed, for lack of a better word. Um, and yet, just like all of Erickson's stages, if you go too far into each one of these, if you're completely independent, you don't rely on anybody ever. You can't get hardly anything done because you're only one person. And... Uh, um, and meanwhile, you know, everybody else just thinks you have no connection to them, which you probably don't. Uh, and if you're too dependent, you're half a person. Um, so all of Erickson's stages are dialectic conflicts like this. Um, and, uh, but in Erickson's case, they have an end result that you're trying to achieve. With Erickson's uh, young adulthood stage of intimacy versus isolation, the, feeling or the end result is supposed to be the acquisition of love. Um, so as long as you get somewhere in the middle, you're not too intimate, you're not too isolated. Uh, then, and keep in mind, this is the actual definition of intimacy. This has nothing to do with sex. This is, you know, really getting to know another individual. Um, so as long as you do this, then you're going to get this. Uh, you're going to be able to actually achieve love, which is interesting because essentially this implies that we couldn't really feel love before. Uh, until we actually went through this conflict and, and solved it. So even when you're 20, you have no idea what love is. Uh, maybe that's the difference between puppy love and a different type of love. But, but he's talking about not just love, but I'd go so far as to say really long-lasting emotion. You know, the type of thing that you could even carry over to your friendships. You know, this will turn your, your friendships from just a couple of guys hanging out in high school to really long-lasting friends that are going to be there till, till the end of your days. Um, now, speaking of friendships, uh, in the social nature of adulthood is, is far different than it is in, um, in the earlier stages. Uh, and a lot of that is, uh, and what I, I, what I want you to do when, when you're thinking about this is either think of your own adulthood if you're, you know, say over the age of 30. Um, if not, think about your parents. If you're under the age of 30, think about what your parents are like compared to what, to what you are. You know, you're in high school, uh, you know, early college. You have a bunch of friends. You hang out all the time. You do all these things. You know, what do your parents do? Do they have tons of friends? Do they have half as many as you do? Um, more importantly, if they don't have as many friends, do they seem bothered by that? If you had the same amount of friends that your parents did, would you be upset? Would you feel isolated? Would you feel lonely? Uh, you know, they probably don't. Uh, and that's because they've completely transitioned into adulthood. And your desires, your social nature is going to change drastically uh, through this particular development. Uh, so you're going to have a dwindling number of associates. Now, some people like to glamorize this and say, well, instead of having a bunch of shallow friends, you have a, you have a handful of really deep friends. That's generally crap that we tell ourselves to make ourselves happy. Um, really, it's that you're just not so needy. Um, teenagers, adolescents, children are incredibly needy individuals. They're, they constantly need reassurance and everything to be all about them and, and adults just aren't like that that we we can't we have to start taking care of other people at this point once you start having a family once you start taking care of other people there's only so much me 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 that can go around um so you have a vastly different store of emotional needs um so if you think about some of the things that the adolescents tend to do um they constantly try to validate their existence. Uh, they're, they're always talking about, uh, you know, what they can do later on or how they've contributed or how they're better than you. Uh, you know, these feelings of superiority are just huge in adolescence. And, and this really dwindles with adults because they have different emotional needs. Um, uh, teenagers often 
essentially force themselves on others emotionally. They, um, because of their, their kind of needy nature, they'll be, um, they'll be constantly trying to interject themselves into things that really aren't their business in any way whatsoever. That's one of the reasons they're so vastly opinionated. Uh, even though the opinions, let's face it, because of the inexperience, are uneducated opinions and, and therefore less worthy than other than a, an adult opinion typically. Um, that they really want to get those opinions out to validate themselves uh, so that they can start to feel good about themselves because they're going through a completely different dialectic conflict. Um, other examples of a uh, adolescent's kind of needy nature emotionally is that they listen to music all the time and they really like the emotional music, music that speaks to them, so to speak. Um, but, you know, how many 40-year-olds, how many 30-year-olds really listen to music as often as, a, uh, uh, as an adolescent does? Um, honestly, they, they have that at this point. They have, uh, uh, they've listened to music, they've gotten whatever inspiration they're going to from that. They still enjoy it, um, but typically they're going to stick with the music they already know. They're not going to be interested in a bunch of new bands. Um, because that emotional need, it's just not hollow for them. They are, they're, they're filling it in because during adolescence, if you remember right, it was all about forming a good sense of self. And they already have that sense of self, so they're no, they're no longer looking for it in somebody else's words and deeds anymore. It's now time to start your own words and deeds and, and kind of look for fulfillment there instead of just trying to validate their existence. Um, I just want to uh, make a, a caveat here. I don't dislike adolescence. It's just that uh, um, they're they can be difficult to deal with, um, and because they have these very difficult and, and needy natures. Um, and yeah, sure, they can be a little bit lame, but can't hold that against them. Um, one of the things that I want to go over because they uh, they really kind of stopped at about this point in the book is relationships because at this point you're getting into intimacy so you're you're getting into relationships you you have a few friends i mean i look back to my parents and uh you know sure when i was in high school i had three or four friends and we were inseparable uh but my father didn't he had you know he had one good lifelong friend and uh they had known each other for 20 years and you know another 20 past that and now as an as an adult i have I have a couple of really good, solid, just lifelong friends that I know are never going to go away. I've not spoken to them for, you know, four or five years at a time because they were on the other side of the country, and then, and then you know, we're uh, we're really good friends as soon as we as soon as we come back. And this is the sort of emotional needs that we particularly need. But developing these different relationships is. Um, it's like a, a stage of development in and of itself, and it can really be fascinating. There's a uh, theorist by the name of Knapp, K-N-A-P-P, and he has what's referred to often as a staircase model because it's five stages up and five stages going down. Um, he has stages of coming together and then stages of coming apart. Now, I'm not going to get into the stages of coming apart. Um, you'd think it would be going apart, but that's not how he named it. Uh, but I will get into nap stages of coming together. Um, and I'll try to use as many examples as I can. Uh, the first stage that nap has is initiating. And this is and uh, this is when people first get to know each other. So you stereotype, you meet a girl at a bar. Um, you see her across the room, you have to you have to say hi, you have to, to try to get to know her a little bit, that sort of thing. That's your initiate, initiating stage. And we're going through that all the time with a variety of people. Because keep in mind, we're talking about relationships in adulthood or any time, but specifically during adulthood. Uh, we talk about non-romantic relationships a lot because in adulthood, you will, you'll typically have one romantic relationship. Like I said yesterday, most relationships in adulthood are uh, romantic relationships are monogamous. Um but meanwhile, you're constantly meeting somebody, and you have a relationship with everybody that you've met, with your doctor, with your uh, your, your, your attorney, with your um, people you hate. You have a relationship with somebody that you hate. It's just not a romantic relationship, you know, unless you dig that. Um, uh, so you have this initiating stage. You get to know somebody, whether it's a girl at a bar that you're interested in dating, um, or you're just you got hired at a new or at a new job, and you're just getting to know the people. 
the next thing that you have is called the experimentation phase. And this is when you're, you're really experimenting at this point. Uh, and again, we're not necessarily talking about sexual experimentation, although that could be a part of it. Um, but you're, um, you're really trying to get to know the other individual. And there are some things that some people like and some things that, that, that they don't dig. So um, when I meet somebody, uh, you know, I do the initiating, and, and if we really hit it off, then uh, I'll invite them to do some of the things that I enjoy doing. And But I enjoy doing a whole variety of things. I, I'm not, not really an armchair person here. Um, so maybe I'll invite them to do archery. Uh, and maybe they'll like it, and maybe they won't. This is part of the experimenting phase. You know, maybe I'll invite them to go sparring. You know, I can punch them in the face a lot. Um, or we can go to a renaissance fair or, or something like that. There are a variety of things that we can do. And you kind of experiment to find out what you have in common and what you don't have in common. Uh, different things you can talk about, different things you can't. You can't. I mean, if you think about the friends that you have, you probably have a couple of friends that you never talk about religion to. You just never talk about it. And other friends that, you, that it might come up a lot. And maybe that's because you disagree a lot, so you've experimented and you found that the, the topics just don't, uh, don't work well. Or maybe you, and if, if it's not religion, you can think of politics in the same way. Uh, or maybe the person's just not that interested. You know, you've experimented, you've tried to talk about religion, and, um, or philosophy, or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And you just find the person isn't that interested in it. Um, so you found that out through the experimentation phase. So you're kind of finding what people have in common during this phase. Now, the third stage is intensifying. And intensifying is kind of a neat stage uh, as well because this is where things, things really start to come to a head. And in a romantic relationship, this is the part we all love. Some people love to jump right into the intensifying stage. This is where um, you're, you're thinking about the other person all the time. You know, you can call it puppy love and a romantic affiliation. Um, this is often where uh, people start having sex, and so they're just thinking about the other person all the time, and they get kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling just thinking about the other person. But this can very much happen with a friendship as well. Um, my fiancé recently uh, met a girl, uh, and, you know, she had moved to a new town and uh, uh, had become friends with somebody, and... Uh, uh, she was just so happy to have a friend, and they had so much in common, I guess, during the experimentation stage. It just worked out so well uh, that she was just giddy thinking about this person all the time. That, that it's like, you know, I have this really good friend, uh, you know, somebody I can count on and I can do favors for. This is a stage where you're really happy to do favors for the other person because it, it just helps you think about them a little bit more, and that makes you happy. Uh, so, so things get really intense during this stage. Now, the fourth stage is integration. And integration is, is kind of neat. This isn't a stage that necessarily everybody's going to get to. Um, obviously, a lot of these stages aren't something that everybody's going to get to with every relationship. You're, you're not going to get really intense if the experimentation stage doesn't work out that well. Integration is where the two become one. And um, and so, you know, if this is a romantic affiliation, then this is where you're going to have uh, the two people that are together all the time. They are in separable. I've got a couple of friends live in New York City. They are Dan and Pasita, or Pasita and Dan, however you want to look at it. And it's actually very strange to hear uh, they, they just happen to know hundreds of people. Um, they really network. And you never hear somebody refer to either Pasita or Dan. You, you hear them refer to both people as if they're one person, and which I guess could be creepy if you want to look at it that way. Uh, but these people are really well integrated. They have a very, very tight integrated bond, so much so that uh, Pasita is a professional dancer. She travels around the world at, at times doing things like belly dance. And uh, uh, yet you still hear people refer to, oh, you know, Dan and Pasita are doing a show. And, and Dan's not a dancer. Um uh, it's it's Pasita's show, but they're so well integrated that this is this is just how we think of them. Um, there are even movies like this. Um, all the movies with Jay and Silent Bob in it. It's Jay and Silent Bob. It's, it's two people, but it's not. It's Jay and Silent Bob. And if you see one, you see the other. So much so that if you were to see one of these people at a party or hanging out, and the other person wasn't there, the first question would be like, "Oh, where's Bob?" You know, because because you don't know. Uh, and it's strange that they're not there, too, because they're so well integrated. Uh, the last stage is 
bonding. And this one is kind of unique because this is where NAP gets into uh, uh, kind of a social contract, uh, which is uh, historically very interesting uh, because we're starting to see this in our, uh, our own political climate as well. You would think bonding would be marriage. Uh, and in a large way it is, but, uh, but again, this can happen for friends as, as easily as lovers. Bonding is a public declaration of a lifetime commitment. So you can make a bonding commitment without, um, without marriage. You can just make a public declaration of a lifetime commitment. When you, um, when you get married, you're making a public declaration, and it has to be socially accepted as well, or else the bonding doesn't go through. Um, it has to be a socially accepted thing. So when you get married, that's obviously what this is. On the other hand, when you get married, who you choose as a best man is a public declaration of no, this is the guy who I want to who, who I want to be my lieutenant. He's gonna he's he's been there for me, and I want to you know I want him to be there and and thank him publicly. Um, and so the public acceptance is very important of this. Uh, so this is where we get into say gay marriage because a lot of people are wondering you know why do gays necessarily have to have uh, marriage? Couldn't some other social contract you know if the if the religious right is really upset about the word marriage? call it something else. Um, as long as it has the same legal boundaries, it's all the same. It really isn't all the same uh, because they also have the same needs as others and want to be able to make public declarations of lifelong commitment. And that's the only way to really finalize the relationship. Um, see, I want to check my time here. Okay. Um, <sighs> So, of course, without this, then they, they basically only get halfway married, uh, which, oddly enough, is what the Supreme Court ruling found relatively similar, that it was kind of doing a disservice to the families that they had to not allow them to have this public declaration. Um, now, when we're, of course, trying to meet different people, we're, we're going to be uh, attracted to certain types of people. There's something called birds of a feather effect. I didn't name it. Don't blame me. Um, and this is the fact that we, we kind of dig those that are similar to us. Uh, that's who we're going to have a tendency to like and who we're ultimately going to have a tendency to love. People we're similar to. Yet at the same time, there's this cliche that opposites attract. Um, uh, it turns out that's wrong. <laughs> They've tested it. They've tested the opposites attract theory and the birds of a feather effect, and they found that the birds of a feather effect is actually true, and the opposites attract is a case of the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Uh, which I went over previously. Sure, it's easy to take any two people and see the things that they, um, if you're looking to see the, the differences that they have, there's a million differences that you have with the person next to you. Uh, you can take two identical twins and find a million differences between the two of them. Um, but in reality, the things that draw us to other people typically aren't the differences, they're the similarities. Um, as far as uh, keeping a relationship together, you have different ways that are used to maintain relationships in adulthood. Uh, and these are going to start to be different than the things that are going to be uh, there in, uh, in adolescence. In adolescence, if you, if you have a really good relationship, this is often going to be based on the fact that you're, you're kind of... Um, you're filling each other's social needs often more than emotional needs. You're, you know, if you're looking for an attractive girlfriend who looks good on your arm and that's what you get, well, then that's a social need that you have. But uh, you're kind of emotionally up in the air as far as who you even are. You haven't kind of finished Erickson's dialectic uh, model there, so you don't have a good sense of self yet. Um, so you don't have the same emotional needs that an adult would. Uh, the theory that I'm going to get into now is called social exchange theory. You can go ahead and Wikipedia that up. There's a whole bunch of good information on it. Essentially, with social exchange theory, you look for certain things in a relationship, and you're willing to give up other things in return in exchange for this. So uh, let's say you take this uh, typical 1950s stereotype that I was talking about before, where you have the good wife, and uh, um, she takes care of the kids and uh, um, 
doesn't have to worry her pretty little head about about the taxes and the money coming in, uh, and the man is the one bringing home the bacon. Well, let's say you take this uh, this stereotype. What the man is looking for is an attractive woman, typically. You know, some youth, some attractiveness. You know, she's got to she's got to make herself look good. Um, and this is uh, I know we like to. We like to bash men for doing this and say double standard, blah, 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 which is crap. Um, it's not a double standard. It's just a different standard, uh, as I'll get into. Uh, because the fact is the woman is, is willing to give up some things for other things just like the man is. So you have the woman who is um, required to be attractive. And this fills a need in the man. It feels a need of, of being needed, of being desired. Uh, men actually have a uh, uh, a very high need of being desired. Um, uh, we express affection in completely different ways than females do, and um, and we we don't express our emotions in this culture as strongly as females, and it's actually somewhat shameful to do. So this desire of being needed isn't fulfilled as easily as it is for females. Um, this kind of leaves us with a, with a vacuum all the time. And so if the female is very attractive, it, it makes us think, well, you know, maybe I'm worth it. You know, maybe, maybe she does want me around because she's going through all this effort. At the same time, we often can't... Uh, because of the social constraints, acknowledge the effort they're putting forth, um, but but it's very much appreciated, and that's one of the reasons why men uh, in this culture desire the female to be so attractive, and, and you know we really value that youth and beauty. Um, yet at the same time, we're willing to give up a lot of freedoms to do so. Uh, we're willing to have all the pressure of having of being the main main breadwinner. You know, this again, I'm talking about this this. 50s stereotype. I know a lot of us don't fall into it anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, all that pressure in exchange for being needed. And the female is, is doing a very similar thing. The female has a higher need for security. And this is a, just an evolutionary thing. You know, they're the females evolved with having a higher need for security because uh, females are so vulnerable during uh, not just pregnancy, but taking care of the offspring and whatnot. The need for protection is just higher for females than it is for men. Uh, they are less comfortable with risks than, than men are in general, uh, for, for good reason. Um, some say they're just wiser. Um, and so they're willing to give up uh, a lot of freedoms so that they can have this security. Um, so that's social exchange theory. You're willing to give up certain things in a relationship to get other things in, in return. And if you think about your own relationships, uh, you have things that you're willing to give up uh, in order to in order to get these other things from your partner. Now, there's also something called equity theory, and this is that with this social exchange, uh, not just a social exchange, but almost any dynamic in the relationship, there is a give and take, and uh, there are credits, for lack of a better description, um, that you give and take when you do certain things or, or give up certain things. And that you want these credits to be equal on both sides of the relationship. And I'll give an example because I know this is a little hard to understand at this point. Um, two people that are in a relationship and both of them hate washing the dishes. Um, one of them hates vacuuming, and the other one hates cleaning the house. So uh, they make an agreement, and relationships do this all the time. They say, okay, I don't ever want to vacuum, so I will clean the house as long as I never have to vacuum. And as long as both people think that this is equal, they're both doing the same amount of work, then that's going to work out fine. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to feel on equal levels, uh, but this is all perception, mind you. So let's say you take these same two people. Uh, neither one of them are doing dishes, because you know, so that's going to lead to a problem in and of itself. But um, but you have one person vacuuming, the other person cleaning the house. Now, the person who hates vacuuming is fine with this. They consider it equal because they absolutely hate vacuuming. But the the person vacuuming feels he's kind of getting the short end of the stick. 
because vacuuming is such an easy job. Now, obviously, if he thinks vacuuming is 10 times harder than cleaning the house, he's going to think he's getting the short end of the stick, and he's not going to be happy with the equity of the relationship. He's like, well, I'm doing all the work, and you're doing none. But the same sort of conflict is going to happen if he thinks he's doing hardly any of the work. Now he feels like a mooch. Now he feels like he's not contributing, and the other person has this power over him to hold it against him. Now... You can solve this lack of equity in a couple of ways. You can have a confrontation about it, which isn't always the most productive thing in the world, uh, or you can just solve it in a different way. So if this person now starts taking up another job in the house, um, now his partner is going to think it's unequal because he's like, well, now you're doing the vacuuming, but now you're doing all the dishes too. And I know how much you hate doing dishes. Uh, so now I'm the one not doing enough work. Uh, on the other hand, you can solve the problem by doing work that the other person doesn't value. So uh, maybe you uh, do more yard work. And your partner doesn't care about yard work, but it makes you feel more productive. You're like, I'm now doing an equal amount that she's doing. She's cleaning up the house. I'm doing yard work and, uh, and vacuuming. So now we're equal again. Now she doesn't have this power over me. And uh, the partner is just as fine because she's like, okay, I'm doing the cleaning, but at least I don't have to vacuum. And, you know, I guess he's doing yard work too, but whatever, I don't care about that. Uh, so that's often a way to get rid of the equity problems um, by either adding tasks that the other person cares about if they feel you're not doing enough work, uh, or adding tasks they don't care about if you feel you're not doing enough work. Um, so I'm going to break it off here because it's been about a half an hour. Uh, we're going to get more into relationship maintenance during uh, the next one and uh, get into some stuff that is clearly not in the book, just like most of this stuff was not in the book um, because they kind of gloss all over this.